what's up? So the Linux root directory structure has kind of a reputation for being confusing to the uninitiated. And I think the answer to that is going over the fundamentals first before we get into the contents of each of these directories. And to start with, I made this extremely professionally drawn chart um, illustrating how we're gonna get from our disk, which is raw bytes, all the way up to that abstract directory structure. The first thing to understand is why we need file system formatting. And there's a very simple answer. And it's that when we have a disk, which is just this stream of raw bytes, right? We need some way for the operating system and the human using the operating system to have some sort of a logical grouping of those bytes. So that way you don't have to like memorize data addresses of the data that you need to go get, right? So that is why a file system format exists. It's gonna turn your disk into files and directories and it's gonna give metadata permissions to those files and directories. It's gonna make sure that applications can access the storage in compatible ways that are not gonna result in like resource contention and data corruption and all that sort of stuff, right? So that is why we have file system formatting and there are many file system formats available, everything from ext4 to fat32 to swap to betterfs to lots of different options for lots of different use cases. But the thing they have in common is they're gonna turn that disk, which is raw bytes, into something that can be logically organized and grouped, okay? So then the sort of top level of all of this is the abstract directory structure, this hierarchical structure that we have here that is the sort of traditional Linux or Unix directory structure. Um, and that is sort of the abstract thing on top. That is not the same thing as the file system format. And I just wanted to clarify that before we move forward. Um, the next sort of key thing to understand is that since we're on Linux, it is really GNU slash Linux. It is technically the GNU core utils plus the Linux kernel. And if you actually keep that in mind throughout this, you'll be golden in terms of understanding how things actually work because you need space for both the GNU core utils stuff and for the Linux kernel stuff. And a lot of these directories actually pertain to one or the other, right? So to start with, we've got our bin directory as well as our sbin directory. And both of these are typically historical directories. Like you'll usually see these now being symlinked into user slash bin. Um, so for example, Arch does that and plenty of other distros that use systemd do that. Um, and I should mention that the hierarchical standard here is a historical standard that's been used for many years. But generally what happens is different distros, different you know operating systems based on it will change things here and there is a trailing standard so they have sort of a protocol that they're going to follow and then they might make slight changes to fit their you know particular flavor of linux better okay so we've got bin and we've got sbin which are our essential uh, command binaries and then the system binaries are going to go in sbin so the commands being things like cat and ls and other core utils binaries right and then sbin has the system recovery binaries so things like fsck and uh, reboot and anything else that you would need to save your system in case of some sort of anything really going wrong with it right and these, like I said, are getting symlinked now into user slash bin um, in a lot of different distros. So they're just binary files and they're all just going to go in the correct place for the binary files to run these programs. And then the next thing to look at after this is actually the library directories, so slash lib. Um, and these are literally just the libraries needed to run those binaries. So for example, like C libraries or the core utils specific libraries, anything that's lib and then a number afterwards are just gonna be libraries for running those binaries. And you'll see the same thing with user slash lib here, right? You're gonna be installing your own applications to user slash bin, and I'll get to that later on, but like user slash lib is gonna have the libraries needed for those applications applications. All right, so next up, we've got the boot directory, and this is where the Linux kernel actually lives. You'll have your Linux kernel, init ramfs, um, anything needed for your init system, you'll have your bootloader, your bootloader configuration. Um, you might have actually been in this directory before if you've done any sort of like a DIY Linux installation, so, you know, not going, going with a GUI and, you know, actually getting into it and doing it yourself. You might have been in this directory, you might have been in like slash boot slash EFI, etc. Um, and this is literally the Linux kernel kernel side of things. This is where you're booting from into the Linux kernel. 
We've got r slash dev device directory, and you might have heard before that everything on Linux is a file. Now, this is not perfectly true, but for the sake of this video, it is true. So if you look in slash dev, you'll see like slash dev slash CPU, a file for your CPU. You'll see your different disks. You'll see the partitions on your disks. If you have a webcam plugged in, you'll see like slash dev slash video zero and anything else that is attached to your system will be present as a device file. Then we've got Etsy, which at one point in time actually stood for etc. Because the original purpose many, many years ago, probably like, I don't know, 40 years ago or whatever, um, was for everything else that did not belong in a different directory. So it was sort of like the leftover directory, hence etc. Um, but by now, the modern use of Etsy is just for specific system configuration. So for example, you'll have like Etsy slash pacman.d for your pacman configuration, etc. Then we've got slash home, which is for your user home directories. And do note that this is almost always separated from slash root, uh, which is your root user home directory. And your main users, like your user that you're currently on is an unprivileged user. And then your root user has, you know, admin privileges. And the idea of keeping these separate is for safety of your system, right? So if something happens to one or the other, the other one wouldn't be affected. And that's also the purpose of having a separated root partition, um, which I generally encourage, you know, just for your own personal, you know, Linux usage, having a separate root partition allows for you to mess around with stuff without worrying about, oh, if I accidentally mess up my root partition, I'm not gonna, you know, erase all my personal files and stuff like that. Um, obviously that depends on your use case. In several, you know, contexts, I can think of that wouldn't be a good idea, but generally I try to do that just for the sake of like, I don't know, I like messing around with stuff. I don't want to nuke my personal home files if I accidentally nuke my root user and root directories and stuff. Um, anyways, so next up we've got, um, we technically have mount, but I'm going to go over logs and lost and found real quick since these aren't actually on the FHS site. So logs is for logs, that's obvious, but lost and found is a pretty important directory. And this is actually here because of my ext4 file system format. It is not part of the FHS to my knowledge. So what lost and found is for is say your system crashes because you know maybe your power went out or something else went wrong. It crashes, you end up with some sort of file system corruption in some various ways. And then you use fsck in order to repair those corrupted files. So lost and found is for those corrupted or orphaned files and it's essentially just a space specifically reserved for the event of a crash and file corruption. All right, so then we get to mount, which is the traditional place of mounting a file system. So say you've got a USB drive and you plug it in. Traditionally, you would mount it to slash MNT and that is the mount point reserved for it. Um, you can technically mount it anywhere. Like if I plug in a USB drive right now, I could mount it to my downloads folder and it would be fine. Um, but MNT is the traditional place for mounting. Then we got slash opt, which I'm actually sort of going out of order. I'm going in alphabetical order mostly, but technically I should be going over user first since user is where your main binary applications are gonna live. But opt is for optional other applications. So sometimes you'll see like software suites are gonna be present in opt. Like if you have, I think LibreOffice installs to opt and I think Chromium. Um, I don't use either of those. So if you do and you know where they install and they're not in opt, let me know. But I'm pretty sure those go into opt. And then other other optional software packages might go into opt. It's just a question of what the you know maintainer of the package chooses to do. Um, then we've got proc, which proc is essentially, I should actually show it to you. So if I list out uh, slash proc here, you'll literally just see a bunch of numbers. And this is just process ID numbers. This is literally just processes currently running on my system. And that is what proc is for showing. It's essentially just going to give runtime information about the kernel and the processes running on your system. All right, next up, I went over root. So we've got slash run. And what run is for is essentially for runtime variable data. So you'll see things like your daemons that are currently running. You'll see files for those. Um, you'll see currently logged in users. And this is like one of those system directories that yeah, you can go look around in it if you want to, but you probably shouldn't be messing with it if you don't have some really specific reason to be there. Um, and honestly, I can't even think of a specific reason to be messing with this directory. So yeah, don't, don't just like go mess with the system directories unless you have a specific reason to be doing so. 
All right, next up we've got SRV, which historically was for hosting servers off of your system. So for example, if you've got an FTP server, you could put the root of that FTP server into your slash SRV directory, and then that would be sharing files over FTP. And honestly, I've never actually used this directory. I don't know if it is still the de facto standard to use slash SRV, but personally, I've always just created a specific folder for an FTP server or an HTTP server or whatever else. Um, so I don't know, if you're a sysadmin and you actually use SRV, then let me know. Um, I don't know what the standard is for this. Um, then we've got temp, which is for temporary files, and this is just going to get cleared at reboot, but essentially it's just going to be files from, you might see like files from your browser or autosaves from specific applications. I think like LibreOffice probably autosaves documents into temp. Uh, sometimes you'll see like, um, I don't know, album art. I'm just trying to think of examples of like what you would see in temp. Yeah, album art that's, you know, going to change every time you change song and that album art might be temporarily getting displayed somewhere anything that's just gonna be a temporary file. And I did actually skip over sys, and that's because I'm not actually sure if there is a page on the FHS for sys, there might be. Um, but anyway, sys is essentially for a structured view of your kernel and devices and drivers, that sort of stuff. Um, and then we've got user and var, which um, user is arguably one of the most important directories just for your actual use. User is an interesting directory because the history of user, um, if I ls out user here, you'll see we've got our bin, our libraries, uh, sbin, etc. But the history of user was actually that it once really did stand for user. It once had user home directories in it back in like, I don't know, 40 years ago, the 1980s, something like that. It had user home directories and that was the original origin of the name user. Um, and now I think people have acronymed it to like user system resources or something like that. I don't know, the abbreviation doesn't matter, but essentially what you're gonna find in it is the binaries for all of your applications, um, depending if if you have other stuff symlinked into it, so for example, Arch-based distros are likely going to have um, bin symlinked into user slash bin. Anything that uses systemd, I believe, would do that. Um, but anyways, that's going to get slapped into user, and you'll just have all of your applications um, shareable but read-only user system resources directory, essentially. And then we've got, lastly, slash var. And var stands for variable, so it's going to be any files that can be variable in size. So for example, log files that are going to increase as your system logs. Um, you've got cache, databases, um, lock files. var slash temp is actually different than just the plain old slash temp in that var slash temp does not clear at reboot. So that's for any temporary files that are not meant to be getting cleared at reboot. And that is pretty much the core directories here. Um, like I said, you will see some variation on different Linux distros and anything, you know, even like Mac OS uses this hierarchy to some extent, you'll just see a lot of changes to it. So essentially the FHS standard is a trailing standard in that, you know, everybody's gonna be using it slightly differently, but it is the base Unix standard that, you know, most flavors of Unix are gonna use now in, you know, the modern era. Anyways, that's about it. I'll see you next time. Peace.